Hi, this is Ed Rising, and welcome to another episode of Ed's Popomatic Podcast, a retro pop culture podcast where everything retro beats a new if you keep it in your heart. And today, very much in my heart, there are two special guests. Not one, but two special guests. Plastic EP, the internet sensation, is here with us today to talk about his career. She's my kind of girl. She's my kind of girl. Soon you'll be close to me, cause you mean the most to me. You're my kind of girl. Yes, you're my kind of girl. I know I'll miss you, and I wanna kiss you, cause you're my kind of girl. I said you're my kind of girl, let's go! A brand new toy I'm your kind of boy You're my kind of girl. Plastic, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm glad to be on Pop Matic, ready to pop, 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 pop culture. <laughs> uh, we're glad to have you here. And my other guest is Nathan Liu, also known as Mr. Shampoo. Hi, Ed. Hi, Plastic. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. And thank you for inviting us both. Yeah, it's a great thrill. Um, as as some of my audience might know, um, there was one, you know, I've been following Plastic EP on uh, his internet radio shows uh, for a while, on Plastic uh, TV and so forth, that he was doing various shows on the monkeys and the Beatles and things of that nature, and uh, getting to know all the people that were involved with it and enjoying the camaraderie that all of you guys seem to have together. And then one magical night, uh, Plastic asked me to enjoy, to join in. And uh, since then, it's been a great deal of fun. And it's been so much fun to be part of working with you guys. And, uh, and so uh, it's a great pleasure to have all of you, to have you guys here with me tonight. We plucked you out of the public, out right? Out of obscurity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and you've, become a, you've become an internet station yourself. And oh, my God. We- we're proud of the podcast that you're doing because Mr. Shampoo and myself support you. We love you how you've just grown and grown and grown. And it's become Ed Rising, superstar. Wow. Well, well that you know. is true because, Ed, you were a natural and Plastic EP has a talent for, um, you know, seeing people that have potential for his shows. And um, you certainly had proved that from – the time that you came on and I could see why he asked you. So congratulations. Well, thanks so much. And it's great to be able to get to do this. And uh, so let's, uh, let's start talking about uh, your career plastic about what's been going on with you and how you got into music in the first place. That is something that we don't talk about as much your music career. Okay. Well, I'm going to start from the start, right? I go to, State school, we call it state school because we're part of the Commonwealth. In uh, the US, you call it an elementary school, the beginning school. Anyway, I'm between the ages, I think of eight or nine or whatever, and I had a music teacher, and I believe his name was Mr. Collier from mem- memory. I'm pretty sure I'm right. And what happens is my parents ended up coming to the school one day. They had like a teacher meeting, you know, where you met the teachers. And while I'm there in the schoolyard, they're talking to 
my parents are talking to the music teacher and he said, can I say something about your son? And they said, sure. They go, do you know that your son has a musical ear? So I got told that from a very young age. And what people don't know is I grew up in a suburb called Hawthorne East, right? Taronga Road, there's a street there called Campbell Grove. And I went to this elementary school, Auburn South State School. Uh, plastic, you're from Melbourne, Australia. So let's make sure That's our right. audience understands that you're coming from uh, the other continent. <laughs> right. I'm near a suburb called Campbell. Campbell and East Hawthorne, they're like two suburbs close to each other. Yeah. So I grew up in there in the 60s. Now, Nathan Lou knows. I'm walking down a street one day to go to Campbell Junction where the shops are. So I go from my street, Campbell Grove, into a street called Havelock, and then I go to a street called Campbell Road. And before I hit... Burke Road, I remember like it's yesterday. This song comes into my head, right? And it goes, I thought you were meant for me. My eyes were misled. You had someone else I didn't know. Please forget all I said. Forget all I said with you. Forget all I said. Forget all I said with you. Please forget all I said. And now I've got the second verse. It's in my head. So now I'm like, as I say, eight, nine years old. And then when I'm... Uh, 23 years old, I record the song exactly the way it is in my head. Yeah. And that became the second uh, vinyl single that we released. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought you were meant for me. of eight, my head was like a hard drive, just coming up with songs non-stop. And not only that, going to state school, elementary school, all I was interested in was the music from America, the music from England, what was happening, because you got to understand, there was no internet in the 60s. Right. I had AM radio. I was soaking it in, every TV show, every new song. And that's why I was born to do what I'm doing now. That's why I've got to like 827 interviews right. because you can't do these shows unless you have the knowledge. You agree, Nathan? 
Well, absolutely. And I'll just let you talk a little bit more further, but I'm coming out from Canada, uh, Calgary, Alberta, and, uh, you know, Flask is coming from Melbourne. And Ed, where are you coming from? I'm from Long Island, New York. Okay, well, that's the greatest thing about what's happening with technology. Us three can uh, do shows like this, and we're all coming from different parts of time zones, and, and you know, it's just great, you know? I started off in 1966 watching the Monkeys TV show, and it was here in July 1967 that the show was shown on black and white TV. We got it later than you, of course, because we're in Australia. So what happens is I bought the two Monkeys EPs, Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're only Australian. Mm-hmm. Right, and the word EPs was in my head from those yeah. two four song EPs. Oh, that is so, so cool. Anyway, so, what happens is I remember buying the monkey's first album, The Monkeys, it was bigger than my head. And I didn't have a record <laughs> player, and I used to take it around to parties and beg people to play it. It's true. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is music has always been in my life, and my biggest influences have been Boyce and Hart who recorded and produced the earliest uh, monkey songs to give him the monkey sound, and Mike Nesmith. So now, from 1967, I just want to get into music. I just want to know everything about music. I never stopped. It's like the Encyclopedia Britannica in my head. And then in 1978, I came up with the idea of Plastic EP, the records. So I already had the name Plastic EP because of a moniker to those EPs of the 60s yeah. Two songs on one side, two songs on the other with a cover, a picture cover on the front. Yeah. So now when we first started, we went punk because the first thing I said to myself, I want to write a song. So I did this song called At Home and it's the greatest song that's ever been recorded for my first song. And I've been blown away because there's only two of the greatest songs that really stand out. It's At Home, first song I ever recorded and wrote. And the second one is Hey Bananas, I Think You're Groovy, <laughs> which in reality, Hey Bananas, I Think You're Groovy, has surpassed everything and lifted me from obscurity to right to the top. See, Absolutely. that's the thing about that's the thing about Plastic EP. It's not like, for when I came on the internet, right, in, in 2020 and started doing interviews, Plastic EP was already established. Like, I knew who I was. Well, that's so what I want to get back to. So it's the rest, it's the rest of the world didn't know who Plastic EP was. So that's what I, I want to ask. Because I've been doing Plastic EP since I was 1978. You can't make this up. And then you look how long it takes from 1978 to 2020 right. to wait for success. Yeah. Now anybody there would have given up the gold suit, the t-shirt, the glasses that I still wear till today. The look is still me. I'm still me. Well, the See, thing is, the thing is plastic. People like yourself like Nathan, like myself as well. Now, I don't have, I'm not musical as far as being able to write music or perform music. I try to sing music and I drive people mad, but I, 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 I'm not musical. But I have it in my heart, in my soul. It is a much a part of who I am that that music stays with you and it becomes part of your life. And so you're able to do this from a young boy to becoming a young man. And then you made your first group Plastic EP in the records, and you had your initial success with the first EP uh, al- album. How I just what- want to say, we started with a single at home, right? That's the first one we released in Australia, 1981. Okay. One, two, three, four. <laughs> you gonna do now, hey now, ooh now, you're feeling blue now, hey now, ooh now, what you gonna do, what you gonna do, without me, without me, without me, yeah, at home, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. watch it by my side, hello, ah, 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 don't run and hide, come on and love me, come on and love me. Ah, 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 ah. 
you here with me? Hello, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Won't you stay with me? No one to love me, no one to love me, no one to love me now. And I say, hey, na na, ooh, na na, what you gonna do? Na na na, hey, now, ooh, now, you're feeling blue now. Hey, now, ooh, now, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? Now on to turn to, now on to turn to, now on to turn to now. Then what happens is in 1981, we recorded a song when you want to make a record, right? And the back song was I'm Coming Back. Song was recorded in the studio. We go back in the studio to do small things and the master tape has disappeared. That's so incredible. Got a, so now you've got a song called When You Want to Make a Record and you can't make the record into vinyl. That, that's that's the irony of it. Yeah, so then yeah, what yeah. happens? Then we record in 1982. I said, let's become the EPs because Plastic EP, the records, is too long. It's like Cliff Richard and The Shadows. And the shadows. Right? So go to YouTube, go to go to a Google, type in Plastic EP, the records. It lasted for a year. Then what happens is I said, I'm keeping the name Plastic EP, meaning the EPs, mm-hmm. and it made of plastic and not vinyl because John Lennon used to refer to vinyl as a piece of plastic. That's where the name Plastic EP comes from, right? So now, as I said, I'm keeping the name. For Plastic EP and the records, we did this punk. Can't do my second song, When You Want to Make a Record, I'm Coming Back. So now, in 1982, we become the EP's The Extended Place. Now we release our third single, which becomes our second single, Forget All I Said It's Secret Love, right? And that becomes a record. So we go yeah. from punk, can't do the punk song, Master Tape's Gone, to go to the third single that becomes the second single. Okay. What?
From there, I've written over 2,400 original songs. You go on the net, you go to YouTube, you go to, you go to all these sites, SoundCloud, whatever, Spotify, you type in the EPs. Then, right. as I said, I've done a brand new album called Plastic EP and the Records Anthology. It's 1981, nine tracks of what we recorded in 1981. Right. It's unbelievable. You know, it's like the other day I wanted to record songs, right? Because what I do is before the interviews was all music, right? Vicky used to walk past and said, we're doing a song. She goes, no, I'm cleaning the kitchen. I said, I don't care. Come here. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do this song on the spot, right? This is the truth. And that was for years it went like that because no one knew in the band for 25 years that Vicky wasn't in the band. No one knew that. And I kept it a secret because I can't keep secrets. Yeah. It's not that I gossip. But this is because of John Lennon, right? Not talking about I'm married. And I mean, the Beatles, that's one part of it. But the other part of it, someone told me, Donna Lawrence said, you didn't want, you want a Vicky to stand on her own two feet. That's why you don't want to say anything about it. And I did. And I'm glad it happened like that. And Wally and I would be writing songs upstairs in my house and we'd be making a joke of it. Hey, Mrs. Place to keep P. Can you make a tea or coffee <laughs> for 25 years? And then people started catching it after 25 years. How come when these guys do videos, Plastic EP and Vicky are close? And that's why, because we're married. Yeah. Well, you know, she's terrific. She's she's definitely your inspiration, and she does these great backing vocals and so forth on the on the on the tracks. Stand with Vicky. When you're in this band for so long and you got a husband like myself from the start, hey, yeah, go and get drum lessons, come back and we're doing songs, you know, and then it will be stop vacuuming, we're doing the song now. And she goes, Do you want to hear the song? I said, forget the song, just sing this part. Ba, 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 ba. I just sing her the part, and she just comes on and goes, All right. And then she'd come by next time doing the housework again. I said, Stop and come and sing on this one. Not again, she'd go, right, and we'll just go like. Forever. And with Wally, the funniest thing is sometimes Vicky couldn't sing backups. Yeah. And I'd sing the high parts. I would sing the high parts on the song because Vicky was busy. And Wally would go, gee, Vicky sounds great. And I said, that's not Vicky. That's me. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So where was it that you and Nathan began to work together? You know, Ed, I was just like any viewer. Uh, you know, it was around the COVID time. And I saw plastic... Um, I do believe it was with uh, uh, Mitch Wiseman, and I always admired him from the Beatlemania Broadway show. And um, I noticed that Plastic, you know, didn't really look like, you know, anything I've seen. It looked futuristic. It looked kind of mod, you know, the 60s. And here's this, here's this Aussie guy, you know, interviewing Mitch Wiseman, you know, which was one of my heroes 
because, you know, I have a tribute band and, you know, we're called All You Need Is Love, tribute to the Fab Four. John Lennon is Van Guerra. Uh, Ringo Starr is Aaron Patton. Um, George is uh, Brian Mendek and Nathan Liu is Paul McCartney. And we have Reed Crapo as Billy Preston. And um, uh, Van and I are Asian. And I contacted Plastic through Messenger and I said, listen, I'm from Canada. I have a tribute band and we're a bunch of um, Lennon and McCartney Asian front guys. Uh, I would love to come on your show. And I tell you, Ed, it wasn't more than about 30 seconds. I got a response from him. He says, wow, can you FaceTime me right now? <laughs> and, and, and to make a you know, short you know, story uh, quick, um, you know, we spoke and I made him laugh. Yeah. And he said to me, you know, I'm going to have some shows and you're going to be on it, but you don't know it. So I'll let you know. When, and I said, yeah, right. And, you know, I was just this musician guy and I happened to be a hairstylist and um, my name is Nathan Liu. And he came up with Mr. Shampoo, <laughs> which rhymes with that name, but I'm also a legitimate hairdresser. Right. And folks, Plastic EP, as you know, is just his, his name on the internet. He's got a real name and so do I, but on the show, everybody comes on as their real names and Plastic and I have fictional names, but we're these characters now on the internet. And, um, you know, Plastic is, is, is 100% in control of his show. So he can write all the, 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 the introduction songs of jingles to game shows to what he wants. He knows what he wants. Yeah. And, and we all know that he doesn't sleep, you know? And one thing that I want people to know is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite close with him and he does a heck of a lot of editing. You wouldn't believe the editing that he does to make his shows look polished and professional. And if ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't, uh, seen it by now i mean plastic sh is show is good enough to be on the network yeah. on any network because they're interesting they're clean they're good they're topics and um you know you became just like myself he handpicks the people that he sees potential in and you know we're all honored because we're making history in pop culture so plastic ep was his mission was to do this and preserve it for generations to come because he has authors to, you know, celebrities, music people, you name it. You know, he's very a diverse individual. And I don't really think anyone does what he does. And he's special to the world. And when I have conversations with him, it's just like you and I looking at each other, just being friends. Yeah. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, when he puts on these glasses, it's <laughs> purely plastic EP. And he doesn't even talk the same. His mannerisms are not the same. There's something very special about those glasses. Because when you're watching the show or being interviewed, you don't realize that he's not looking you in the eye ever. You know, <laughs> you know he, right? You know what I mean by that, Ed? Yeah, I do. He, he doesn't do it for capital. He does it for the love of music and pop culture. He also writes his songs. He's got like... I don't know if it's 2,500 or 4,000 songs. They're all original songs. Yeah. There are wonderful people that are in the Beatle world or in the Elvis world. I'll just mention a few because there's just too many. And if I leave anybody out, please don't be upset. You've got uh, Chachi LaPrette. You've got Charles Roseney. You've got Ivor Davis. You've got all these people and so on. And, you know, they are on his show supporting plastic and you know plastic couldn't do these shows without these people yeah well one of the you greatest know. things that he's done and plastic i don't need to leave you out of it or uh, talking to like you like you about you like you're not here because you are most definitely here uh, and while we what i've enjoyed so much is the camaraderie between all of you people and the fact that you were able to take a serious situation like the pandemic Yes. Bring people together, bring people together in music and discussions of music and pop culture and movies and TVs and whatever it might be. 
various different subjects and and I think that's great and and and, I, and so much fun and and informative and so um you know uh, I just was curious about how uh, since since you were all the editor that you are plastic how it is that you came about deciding that you wanted to do uh, a zoom type of situation where you had these panels and putting these together. Could you explain a little bit about that? When the pandemic hit, that was when Zoom was happening, and I said to Vicky, I'm going to do interviews, right? And the platform was there for me to do what I did because up until that point, it's like I appeared from nowhere, like I came from another planet, and the pandemic is, and there's this guy, Plastic EP, this character, like Elvira, that's he's ready to go, you know, he's ready to take on the world and, like, what is this guy? Who's plastic? What's plastic? What is this thing? Who's this guy from Australia that is, like, unbelievable and has got a song called Hey Bananas with Dick Groovy? Because I I looked at all my songs and I said, which song is going to work for major commercial, you know, response? Marketing and all that, yeah. And I thought, if it's the US and that's my market, I said, it's not Australia, right? I'm going for the US by the throat. I go, Hey Bananas. We think your groovy is a song to take me there because it's so way out and crazy. And it's, as I said, a little bit of a tribute to the banana splits. And I actually <laughs> interviewed the guy, Bingo, from the banana splits. So where's the uh, fireman's hat? He's got the orange and yellow outfit with the big glasses, right? Right, remember. And I said to the guy, Terrence Wilkins, Wilkins, I think his name is right when I did the interview. And I said, you know, I wrote a song as a slight tribute to the banana splits. He goes, no. I said, what, geez, 1968. I go, here it goes. And I played the song. He's blown away. You know what he said? He said, you nailed 1968 right there on that song. <laughs> Tell me that in the interview. It's in the interview. Yeah. This is what I talk about. I'm so diverse. I interviewed the guy from Lands of the Giant. I can't, I can't go back. I need like one year to write out a list of everybody I've done because I'm too. I'm moving forward. I'm in cyberspace so far ahead that like – Everything, there is nothing in front of me and there's nothing behind me. And I'm 24-7 on the net (laughs) and it's like, I'm cyberspace. It's like, I feel that movie Tron, you know, that that movie Tron, that's the only way I can describe the way I really am. I remember that. Well, that's cool. You know, the great thing about the song is also, is that if you listen to the, if you go to Spotify or one of your streaming uh, platforms for music, and you type in the EP, so you type in plastic EP and the records, you're going to find a lot of these songs. And most of them, 99% of them, are about love. And that's what I think is so refreshing. Because you have oh, yeah. so many of these bands that write such negative things, you know. And, 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 uh, and so I just enjoy it because it's about, about, it's about love. Well, you know, Ed, what I like watching... Uh you know, plastic EP shows myself is uh, these guests that, you know, were from the fifties or the sixties that are icons and heroes, they trust plastic EP. So they tell him stories that nobody else has heard. And for authors or for anybody that's into these um, shows like the Beatles or the monkeys or Elvis and so on, you're going to hear things that are on his show that, you know, his personality can draw these people that trust him, you know, because, you know, a lot of people get duped, you know, in interviews and stuff like that. And um, I often tease plastic EP. I say, you know, uh, you know, here's a kid that's eight years old walking down the street, wrote a song in his head. How did you ever realize that you were going to interview some of these people that you admired uh, growing up, you know, to do with the Beatles and the monkeys and, you know, you know, plastic has basically covered them all. Isn't that right, plastic? Yeah, I'd say so. And the amazing point is, Vicky said to me, why do you collect all these collectibles? My house is full of collectibles. I've been collecting since the 60s. Yeah. She goes, why, why do you collect all these things? Because I said, I live in pop culture. Yeah. But it wasn't until I did interviews that I actually realized that I was born to do this. Right. Do you know what it is to be able to say, I'm born to do interviews. That is my main purpose in life. You got the music, yeah. but then you got the interviews. Uh, I enjoy like- the interviews because you've had some really good people on, as Nathan was saying, to be able to give you some really good exclusives and some really, really heartfelt discussions. For instance, uh, uh, Steve Binder, 
who was the producer of Elvis's 1968 special. That was outstanding. And you had, and I, I don't remember his name exactly, but the gentleman who was the director of the original Let It Be movie with the Beatles. That was Michael where, Lindsay Hogg. Michael those Lindsay were two, Hogg. two. Those were two of the very best. The three Ed, interviews with Michael Lindsay Hogg. Nathan Lou will tell you about it. Okay, Ed, I'm going to tell you something that only Chachi LaPrat, myself, and maybe Charles Rosney, and a few other handful of people know. Plastics is going to kill me for this one, but. <laughs> You know, here's a tidbit because, you know, I'm in the inner circle of Plastic EP, I guess. But, you know, the Let It Be booklet that came with the, the box set back in the day? Yeah. Well, Lindsay, believe it or not, Lindsay Hogg did not, Michael Lindsay Hogg did not have a copy. So, Chauchi Lepret have two copies and gave one to Plastic. Plastic EP sent it to Lindsay Michael Lindsay Hogg. Michael was so gracious and signed it personally to Plastic EP. People don't know that he has that. And he, yeah. doesn't, he doesn't show it because he's so humble about it. Isn't that right, right. Uh, Plastic? Yeah, that's right. I mean, think about that. To yours truly, from Michael Lindsay Hogg, I would, I would line up for days in the rain for that. Yeah. Wouldn't you, Ed? That's amazing. It's an amazing collectible it, to have. It's more than a collectible. It, because... it's, not, it's more than a collectible because yeah. I'll tell you, and, and Michael Lindsay Hogg trusted Plastic EP and he had not done an interview in about 12 years. So Plastic was exclusively able to do that before the Get Back series on Disney Channel. Isn't that right? Uh, Plastic wasn't the timing a ripper? I spoke to Michael Lindsay Hogg for two interviews right on uh, July and then we did the uh, third interview in December after the Let It Be uh, Specials, but what I want to tell you is I've got a letter here, right, from the book, and it's a letter from Chachi Lepret, right? Just so you know, so I'm gonna read you a bit because Chachi Chachi doesn't basically <laughs> no publicity, but you can see that. But that's a letter from Chachi about the book, right? I'm gonna read you a bit. Okay. Just for your just for your uh, people watching this on video and for your podcast, okay? Right, what happens is he's written a letter and what he's basically said is, enjoy this book which I purchased at the Discount Record Store in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts back in 1971. So he bought it in 71. For only 99 cents. Oh. And, I have, and I have two copies and I bestow one upon you, my friend, because I know you will cherish and care for it forever. Yeah. So what I was is we were interviewing Michael Lindsay Hogg, and I've got, and now I've got Chachi's book, right? Because he he parted from it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'll send your book, I'll send your book. So after the interview, I got his address and I sent him the book. And then what happens is he's still keeping in contact with me. And we're still talking about this book, Michael Lindsay Hogg, and I said, I've sent it to you. And then apparently a couple of days later, the book turned up and he used it. He thanked me. I said, listen, yeah. Michael, it's a privilege for you to use the book. Do me a favour. Please keep the book. It's yours. It's no problem yeah. for me. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, no, I can't. You're a collector. You know, I can't keep this. You're collecting this <laughs> stuff. And I'm going, this, for you, for you, Michael Lindsay Hogg, like I'm going, it's no problem. Don't worry about it. Just keep yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah. Like you the know, postage, the postage to send it back to me is worth more than a book. Anyway, he goes, no, 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 I've got to send it this and that. And then he went to his post office. He couldn't get my, hang on, they couldn't work out my postcode. I gave him a postcode. They can't find my postcode where I live. So I gave him the city of Melbourne, hoping that that will do. Wait. So then I said to him, if you're going to send me the book back, right, can you sign it? Yeah. I'm thinking, what's well, coming back to my house anyway? Right. What's right, the big right. deal if he signs it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he signs it and it turns up at my house in one piece and I'm thinking, no, this is good. <laughs> this is great, you know what I mean? Come on. The guy filmed all of Let It Be, filmed everything. Incredible. He had the original film that Peter Jackson used 60 hours of. The guy is an innovator. The guy is one of the greatest filmmakers, directors of all time. And all yep. I say is Michael Lindsay Hogg, we salute you. 
And that's what, that, was all, that was all, that's what, what was so great about the Get Back movie. And then your interviews to be able to realize that, yeah, okay, Peter Jackson may have edited that whole eight hour production, but it was all Michael Lindsay Hogg. That's right. Who filmed all that, had yep. all the ideas. He was the one that came up with the idea of putting that microphone in that flower pot to capture yeah, that's the conversation right. between John and Paul. I mean, but, that's just genius right there. Yeah, but just I want to say something about the story about that book. Now, Chachi LaPrette has done Breakfast with the Beatles for probably 40 or 45 years. So he's well known in the Beatles world. Now, Plastic is such a gracious man that something came over him and he couldn't sleep. He says, you know what, Nathan? I'm going to get Chachi LaPret on this Michael Lindsay Hogg interview. And Chachi said, you know what? Thank you, Plastic. It was the greatest moment of my life in the Beatles circle. Is that not a true story, Plastic? You tell it. A true story. Did I not tell you, Nathan, I can't do this interview. I can't do this interview without doing it with Chachi LaPret. At least I said I've got to ask him if he can do it. And it's off my conscience that I asked him if he wanted to do the interview. It was like a vision. It wasn't about me. I yeah, wanted to yeah. share the interview with Chachi. That was my whole aim. And I knew if Chachi could do it, at least I told him about it. I couldn't sleep if I didn't tell yeah. him. You know, that's just the kind of person I am. Well, but, but by was- the same token, when it came time for you to try to uh, work with the exclusive radio and looking at different yeah. radio stations so like, they were putting Sorry, together, I just want to say, let's not talk about exclusive radio. We've okay. got to just edit that. <laughs> okay. Right. It's, All just, right. it's better. I got my shows now. We just left okay. that out. So, 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 so I wanted to say that, um, you know, here's this eight year old Greek kid walking down the street. He didn't know what was pl- planned for his future, but it was way above what he ever thought it could be, Ed. I'm telling you. And I always told, um, you know, plastic, if, ladies and gentlemen, he has Greek. Uh, you know, background. So I think yeah, my star- parents were Greece. My yes. parents were Greek from and Northern I, Greece. Yes. And I think that the stars were aligned for plastic to preserve pulp culture in our hearts, in our lives yeah. and plastic. We thank you for that. And, you know, it's so good to become your friend and what you've done for me and the band and everybody else in the world. You know, this guy doesn't want a penny. Yeah. He, you know, the thing about plastic EP Ed is, he doesn't copy anybody. He's original. And that's why I gravitated with him two years ago. I was there when Plastic had his first 100 show. And Plastic <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, 100 shows, Nathan. I can't believe it. But look where he is now. 900 almost. <laughs> yeah. Right, Plastic? No, we're, we're, going, we're going to 1,000. It's no big deal. I might even miss the 900. I haven't got time. I just want to get but, over and done but, with. But, but Plastic, you remember I was there with you for your 100th show? Yeah, but you also got to understand that something, Nathan. When you contact me, okay, this guy's a performer. This guy's got it. This guy's got so much potential. This guy's a goer. Bang. It only took me 30 seconds to make up your mind. You got to understand, success is not just like, it's me. It's I've never been like that. It's not about me. It's about me with others that, you know, make it. That's the difference with the Plastic EP show. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I got the funniest things that have happened to me in my life is like, get emails and people say, what's plastic? Who's plastic? Uh What is that plastic? What is this? You know, this is like Elvira being Elvira and Plastic EP being Plastic EP. And Nathan knows, the minute I take my glasses on, I'm not not joking to you. That's right. This is like no big deal. But the second I put the glasses on, it's like I've got so (laughs) much like this energy and power behind me. I'm not joking. It's just... It's instant because yeah. Plastic EP has been with me like since 1978. Since you were a little kid. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, you know, Ed, uh, Plastic EP, and I can go back two years. When he started, his show fundamentally was on people that haven't been discovered yet. Acts that nobody's seen, puppets to spaceships, you name it. And then he grew and grew and grew. People wanted in. He started becoming um, a household name that, you know, uh, celebrities would say, oh, I know who Plastic is. I want to go on his show. If you watch a Plastic yeah. EP show, the artist will say, it's a pleasure to be on your show. 
it's usually plastic saying it's a pleasure you being on my show. So, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. you know, and, you know, some of these shows on the network, they just interview these stars for five seconds. And, you know, that's what I like about plastic EP. It's much more thorough. Yeah. And plastic, yeah. And plastic EP has become a very, very good interviewer. And you have so many people that regularly come back again and again uh, to be part of it and to be interviewed. Um, I just want to just uh, quickly say, um, first of all, Nathan, we hope to have you back on the show at some further point because I'd like to talk a lot more with you in sure. regards to be my pleasure, all, you, all you need is love band and other things that you're doing and what you would like to promote. If there's anything in particular that you want to promote right now, would you like to tell us about that? Well, you know, um, I don't think I can get any money for it, but I know you're a huge uh, David Cassidy fan, and I always liked my hair to be like, because he had the best <laughs> part in the world. So sometimes I wake up and I got that part. So I have yeah. David Cassidy hair going. Yeah, back. it makes me think of David. <laughs> well, but that's uh, you so know, cool. I want you to know that before he passed away, uh, he was playing the casino that I was playing at, and he was there the week before I was there. Oh, okay, cool. I, I didn't meet him or anything like that, but you yeah. know, it was David Cassidy. And uh, uh, I always wanted to say something about David Cassidy to you. Um, um, the song, I Think I Love You. Um, I don't know if people realize this, but they, they actually sped up the original version to make him sound more popish. That's right. But, there, but I sent you the original where it slowed down and he sounds more like he should. He sounds more throaty, more... Of that's a, right a bluesy type voice so that yeah. song was sped up and yeah and, yeah and, and and you know one of my favorite shows that plastic had was to do with the wrecking crew people i love and people still to this day don't know who the wrecking crew is right so right right you know and we have guys like daniel costin that come on there and talk about the beach boys and you know countless people like kid old tool isn't that right uh plastic we've had all these people that are internet people that yes people listen to us. And, yes, yes, and you know what? I, these are the people I've met through Plastic Show, and now I, we, we've all become friends. And you've, been to, the, you've been to these. I've been, been to been, these festivals. I've right? been to the Beatles have... Festival. I get to meet Kid personally. Yeah. I yeah. met Jan Mitchell personally. Yeah, and things like dinner. that. So you know, it's been quite. I had dinner with Danny Lane. That's I, right. I, not Danny That's Lane. Right. Lawrence Cheaper. I mean, it That's was right. absolutely blew my mind. But and, uh, you know, it is so. This this is it's really been a sensation. To be able to get to know people through the pandemic, a lot of it through Plastic EP, and so um, uh, just don't... just what just one second here, Ed. I want yeah. to ask you how you found out about Plastic EP. I was uh, following Fred Villas on Facebook. I'm not quite sure why or how, but I was on Zilch, uh, the Zilch podcast Facebook page, and I think Fred is very uh, uh, not vocal, but very very popular there. And so I got to, you know, get to know him a little bit. And then I and, saw that he was on uh, an interview with Plastic GP. So well, what's this all about? And, and then and I. What were your thoughts about him? Your immediate thoughts when you saw his well, glasses and well, his first background? Of all, and I, and I, and I, when I saw the whole group there, I thought, well, this guy is out there. This guy, Plastic EP, is like, wow, coming in from Melbourne, Australia, as if he was coming in from Mars, which he likes to talk about now. But And it was just a lot of fun. And just the way that everybody, everybody interacted with one another. It was so much fun. I learned a little bit about the music. I enjoyed listening to everybody's opinions and so forth and Plastic's <laughs> music and bringing all his stuff in it was great it was a great time it was a lot of fun and what attracted me to his show was there's nobody like him he's not copying anybody and i tell oh. him about that all the time that you know it's it's very hard to express yourself by being original okay because i copy one of the best bands in the world but plastic ep has nobody to copy yeah so yeah. you know do you know who his competitor is no. Himself. himself. Ask him that. That's Ask him question. that. He competes against himself. Isn't that true? <laughs> That's a thousand percent right. Because I'll tell you something even about songwriting, right? I just want to say this quickly and say another point. But, you know, I got, I got to the point, right, when you start writing songs and you say, right, I want to write songs. And that's like my life. I want to devote every spare minute of my life, right? When I was younger, I'm working. 
But every single, I've got, and I've got a family, right? I'm just saying, and even before I was married, every single minute I had, I put into my craft of writing songs. And that's what people don't understand. You work at it, you work at it, you work at it, and you keep doing it, and you never give up. And that's exactly what I did. Now, no one, a lot of people can start, and then they just say, it's not working, I give up. I never gave up. I was in the band, place to keep in the records. Unfortunately, a few people have passed away. You know, my songwriting partner, Wally's passed away, right? And it's like, I carried on. I found the nephew, right? He's classically trained. We worked on it. I explained him the way I did music. Yeah. Just like it was easier for me now because for all the years I spent with Wally Wright from 1978 yeah. to when he passed away, you know, yeah. that's a commitment. Yeah. You know, it's like anything in life you really want, you've got to make that commitment. Yeah. I mean, hey. I didn't want to go out and socialise. I just wanted to write songs, song, song, yeah. song. And then yeah. what happens is you've got to understand, it's like the Rubik's Cube, Right. Once you know how to put that Rubik's Cube together, you got the knowledge. The yeah. thing with songs became a joke with me because the formulas and whatever, I worked it out, I wrote it out. You know, like I spent years and years and years like what Elvis songs are they? Wrote, wrote them out, Beatles songs. Wrote them out, Everly Brothers songs. Wrote them out, everybody that influenced the, the Beatles. Wrote them out, the Monkees. Wrote them out. Well, as I said, Boyce and Hart, Michael yeah. Nesmith, my yeah. biggest influences from 1966 it started. I want to write songs. I'm just yeah. saying. That's what, what it was. That was what did it. But then, as I said, when you get to 2,400 songs, it became a competition with myself. And this is true. No one knows. I formulate three or four songs in my head. I go, in the, I go to record them and I go, and I write the title down. I go, song A. Write the title down. Song B, write the title out, song C, write the title out, song D. And then I look at them and they go from my head and go, song C is the weakest, right? The weakest song in my mind. Okay. So when I go in there, now I'm recording four songs, one after the other. That's very hard to do in a session, right? I come to song C and that's when I go, boom. <laughs> and then song C sort of becomes number one because I lift it from third place to number one. That's a competition. Because you have, to put, you have to put so much more into that one because you think that's going to be the weak link. You don't want it to be weak. So you're putting so yeah. much more into it and it becomes number one. That's very cool. No, but what I'm trying to say is the problem with that is, I'll be honest with you, the analogy is I can write a song and go, hey, this is great, and I'll put it out there. It's not the greatest. The one that I don't think is the greatest, I think this is... Yeah, it's all right. Mediocre, that's the one they love. And the more kooky the song, the more they love it. People don't know that I've done a song of um, comic songs. I put it out. What happens is there's like 100 albums out there in the world, right? And it's too many. So then I started doing EP's Mania 1, like yeah. the greatest hits well, of the yeah, EP's. Just... And I went to 2030, and at the moment, I've got so much on going. Now, Ed, you know that Plas has been talking about his shows and his songwriting ability and stuff like that. But there's much more because we have a very uh, good friend of ours. He's an American. Um, his name is Johnny Rock. He has a fantastic radio show. So he, Plastic was asked to do a radio show. So, you know, Plastic said, OK, I'll dabble in that, Mr. Shampoo. And congratulations. It's great. And Ed, you don't know this and most people don't know this, but Plastic has also made movies. Is that not the truth, Plastic? I've done six movies. They're on there you YouTube. Go. You, wow. You type, you type in the word Plastic EP in lowercase. P-L-A-S-T-I-C-E-P. Lowercase, that's all. You go to my channel. There's like two, 300 videos there. And then yeah. I've got six movies, right? One's called Popstar Mania, right? 64. <laughs> I right, see then that. I've got one. Then you got one called uh, Monsters from Outer Space, right? That's great. And then you got That's all good. these other ones. And Vicky's in it. Wally's in it. And, like, I jam in 15, 16 songs into these movies, and it just it just goes. Like, it's just something I've never seen. Well, it's just an incredible it. thing to be able to, to have all this, all this creativity. 
and put into it, you know, the music, the videos, the new movies that you're making, doing the internet shows, doing all these live streams and whatever. You know, it's a lot of work. And, you know, you, I, I really think it's a great thing that you're able to put all this together and also keep going even after you lost a partner. You know, and, I and mean, you know, that's a big deal. Yeah, that's you know? right. And you, know, and, you know, Ed, Plastic said to me, you know, Nathan, no one's doing it. We're going to have a game show. And it evolved. And Charles Rosenay, you know that we love that guy. And he's got a sense of humor. Yeah. He came on. He came on as, you know, our, our beautiful Charlene. And I'll tell you, Plastic and I, we were cracking up. There's an episode where, I, I swear, Plastic fell off his, his chair. And it's just the most infectious laughter. And it was so organic and natural. <laughs> Plastic, do you remember that episode? How funny well, I'm gonna tell you. I'm going to tell you an episode where, I don't know why, but it could have been my birthday or something or a hundred whatever shows. So I'm interviewing this lady and I got balloons. And then while I'm interviewing, one of them pops because it's helium. And I ducked down under the desk. I thought someone was shooting me. <laughs> True. I went straight to the floor in the interview. I thought someone had a shot at me. <laughs> and, I, thought, and I thought the Charlene episodes with plastic. The first time I saw that, I had me on totally falling apart. It was hysterical. It was so great. Uh, Plastic, I just wanted to ask you, now I understand you've got a, a pop radio show that you're doing, a Beatles radio show that you're doing. It's called the Plastic EP, Beatles Hour. And what it was, is I've had everybody on the show. It's still going. It's on Johnny Rock Radio every Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. It's The show is then repeated 7 p.m. Eastern time. These shows play once, and then later on down the track, they're going to be made in a podcast. We don't even have time to play the podcast. So I make the show. They play the show on Johnny Rock and Roll Radio every Saturday, as I said, here in the morning, if you miss it, here at 7 p.m. at night, on the Plastic EP show with Leslie Cavendish, we squash that rumour. And I asked Leslie, I said, let's end this rumour once and for all. You've cut Paul's hair so many times at his house at 7 Cavendish Avenue. When you cut his hair, is it his face? Has it changed? Has his body features changed? Is a different person? Any characteristics change? I said, no. You've got to understand something. When you cut someone's hair, they fall in a certain pattern. And they'll always fall in that pattern, no matter what. And I said, let's squash the rumour once and for all. You're the man to help me do it. Tell him Paul McCartney, he's not dead and you've been cutting his hair and there wasn't ever a problem. <laughs> and he goes, that's correct. Yeah. Nice Hi, to Vicky. see you. Hi, Nathan. Mr. How Shane. are you? Hi, How are you? Ed, <laughs> Ed, if you've got one question to ask her about Plastic EP, yeah. ask it now. I will. So how does it feel to be the woman behind the man and behind the glasses? Oh, it feels amazing. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> We are too. I mean, we are too. You've done it without me, that's for sure. No, absolutely. That's a very <laughs> good line. have to take some credit. <laughs> he couldn't do it without Vicky. I think that's uh, especially wonderful. Especially when he has to find his clothes. You know, where's my suit? Where's my, where are my glasses? <laughs> Look, that's the man wonderful. is brilliant, as you know. So um, he does, I mean, you know, he is the whole package and it's yes. great to be his partner. Thank <laughs> you, Can you Vicky. tell him the story? This is true. That for 25 years, I never said that you're in the band. And Wally and I used to say, can we have a cup of tea, plastic EP? And you'd be going around vacuuming and I'd say, can you stop? You've got to sing on this. And you'd know what's going on. And you'd say, can I hear the song first? And I'd go, no. Yeah, he still does the same thing. I still have to help him with his songs and says, come now, I need you to sing right now. And he well, that's will a just tell sound, me the words. He won't even write them down. He just tells me, do say <laughs> this. And I've got to just do it like a puppet. <laughs> Ah, it's great. It's great fun. I love, I really enjoy the songs, you know, stuff like I really like bubble gum or uh, oh, I'm in the mood for bubble gum. And of course, Hey Bananas, you know, that's my favorite. That's my favorite song. <laughs> oh, great. But you know, Vicky, you look very well and it's nice to see you. <laughs> and you can see it's freezing in Melbourne at the moment. It's still very, very cold. Oh, <laughs> well, it's, it's all spring. Anyway, good to see you both. Good Bye. seeing you, Vicky. Take Ciao. care. Thank you for stopping in. One of my favorite uh, uh, interviews with um, 
uh, plastic was the importance of the meeting between Elvis and the Beatles after the Hollywood Bowl in California. And Ivor Davis was the Beatles journalist. He was there. And Ivor Davis has a liking to plastic and he trusts uh, plastic. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to hear these stories on plastic's show. And some of the stories, one of the stories was the Beatles always played the same set list, but when they played Kansas City, they opened with the song Kansas, Kansas City. City. And Ivor Davis was there. So if it wasn't for Ivor, this is all gets lost. And that's why it's great to have pop culture from plastic because it gets, you know, recorded. And this and these shows, plastic says, you know, 25 years from now, we won't be here, but these shows will be here. And I've done my job in a short time. Yeah. And I've gotten all these people and congrats to you, Plastic. Yeah. Well, I just oh. want to mention about Ivor. Got to understand. When the Beatles met Elvis, right? And I think it was 1965 from memory. This man, Ivor Davis, was the first journalist, UK journalist, living in America, got told, go to San Francisco, met up with the Beatles. You're on the first US tour. He goes there, he meets the Beatles. He's with them for five weeks in their suitcase, basically living with them, everything. He's there. You don't know how big that was for back then. And then he's there when Mal Evans rings him or whatever and says, come down, we're going to meet Elvis. And that Ivor Davis is there driving with them to go meet Elvis. I mean, that's mind-boggling. It is. You've got to understand, as a child growing up, when you hear about the Elvis meets the Beatles, you only hear about it. There's no internet. There's no nothing. There's not much you know about it. And then things change, right? Somebody's written books about Elvis meeting the Beatles. But it, unless you're in the room and you know what's going on, yeah. it doesn't mean nothing. Right. The minute right. I met Ivor Davis and he told me I was on the first US tour and he told me he was there, Elvis meets the Beatles, that he was physically there, to me, that was my whole world turned around because here's somebody living that I can talk to and ask him things that I want to know from a young child when Elvis met the Beatles. Right. That, that's the importance. Up until that point, no one can tell me what's going on. Don't worry what, right. whatever anyone says, unless you're actually physically, it comes out of their mouth. That's like gospel. That's the truth. Well, yeah. so amazingly, what, amazingly, you were able to get Ivor Davis on and, speak with him and a lot of these other people and you get these direct stories that nobody else really gets. I do a 35 minute interview with Ivor about Elvis meeting the Beatles. Six months later on commercial television in him in Melbourne, they spent 10 minutes with him about Elvis meets the Beatles. Six right. months after and my interview is in depth. 35 minutes, it's all there. It's going to live forever. Right, that to right, me right. is the importance of things. Yeah, People don't understand the Plastic EP chases these things, right? I've gone from being an interview, I've gone from being an interviewer to being like this Ivor Davis was in those days when you had no internet, you had no nothing. You got your new, you got your pad with your pencil, you got your typewriter, and you went and found these people physically to do the interview, and then you typed it up, and then you faxed it off. That's how they did it. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and you know, Ed... You know, one of the funnest shows that Plastic and that I, we discussed was a fictional band. And Ron McNeil from the Fab Four came on this show and we did a show called The Ruddles. And it just yes. went unbelievably crazy. Do you remember that show? I think I saw, uh, yeah, I think I saw uh, that one. Uh, uh, Plastic I got to Al say something. You know what? When we spoke The Ruddles and we talked about their album, do you know that got higher rating than any Beatles album show we did? Uh, there you go. <laughs> We all love the Ruddles. And not only that, you know what? When we talk about the Ruddles, people just love them. They go crazy for the Ruddles. But you know the other show that I really liked is we wanted to do the greatest Beatle album of all time. That panel is unique because already knew what's knowledge is knowledge. Everybody knows Sergeant Pepper, right? Revolver, you know, what, what is it? The White Album, uh, Rubber Soul. These are, these are great albums, you know. What is their best? And then after, by the time we finished with the panel, Rubber Soul, US version, came in at number one. That's and right. no one even mentioned 
No one right. even mentioned Sergeant I did. Pepper. I mentioned so Robert Yeah, no, but but get that. <laughs> you know, that that guy proves what we don't know nothing until we actually do it. That's, uh, right. that's what I've come to. Don't. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is, don't come to a conclusion when you don't know. You know, that's what it is. Don't yeah. assume. Yeah. I, I thought, no way. You know, no way. Rubber Soul's going to come in at number one and bang. It was there. All the others yeah. didn't mean anything. Blue ball. Mine, yeah. mine was a hard day's night. Yeah, I love yeah, a hard I, day's night. I was please, please me. And the reason being, the idea was, you had to have a reason for picking the album. And my reason was, if they didn't do please, please me, they wouldn't have done the other albums. Which is, and I love please, please me. Yeah, and it's a group sound. And that's the difference about some of these other albums is that in the later years, they don't sound so much as a group as they are in trying to accomplish a particular sound. Um, but anyway, uh, again, Plastic, I want to thank you for being on the show. Nathan, I want to thank you for My being pleasure, on Ed. the show. It's been great. Plastic, you know, you always tell us that you're from out of this world and you're from Mars or whatever, but I, I, I'm going to tell you, you are from the heart. You are a genuine, you are a friend. And uh, it's been, it's been, it's been a, a real pleasure to get to know you and to be working with you and so forth. So, look, you guys have a great day. Join Thanks, that. Ed. Thank you for coming on the Ed's pop podcast, a retro pop culture podcast or everything retro beats anew, if you keep it in your heart. My name is Ed Rising, and please find us all on Facebook and Spotify and so forth. And look for Nathan's band, All You Need Is Love. And go Thanks, and find Plastic EP on Facebook and YouTube and, and check out his interviews and all his shows. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Mm-hmm.